Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Minov. And I'm Pat Shelton. Welcome to Real to Real. Well, Pat, it doesn't seem like it was only two weeks since Easter. It seems longer to me. And, and a lot now, of things are happening. Yes, we're well into the throes of springtime. Springtime, when a young man's fancy... Turns to love. And the <laughs> brides are finalizing their plans for their June weddings. And children are waiting for school to be over. And I'm getting a spring cold. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you can live with that, though. Yes. But when you know the spring cold is over, it's summer is here. Yep, I'm looking forward to. The opportunity, though, of looking forward to many things is a, a beautiful experience because, you see, what we're going to show you today especially is something about racetrack chaplains, which is quite unusual, but not unusual, but very interesting for us. Mother Catherine Drexel and her Sisters of Blessed Sacrament, they are now looked upon maybe as interstate sisters, would you believe? <laughs> and if springtime is here, can the Catholic charities be far behind? No. But what do they do with our contributions? We'll find out today. Along with uh, Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons in our relationships segment, when we'll also get a, get a clue as to why we are the way we are. I wonder about the way we are, though, Pat, because when you think about how we begin and things get started, you get involved in so many things which will try to change you around. However, Mother Catherine Drex and her sisters are not changed around. But what we see now is the fact that what began in peace and serenity through modern traffic now stays simple and the same. Quiet and peace, a majestic enclave on a hill of natural beauty. That was yesterday. Today, quiet and peace is punctured by the rolling thunder of a highway. It's Interstate 95, a major artery of the eastern United States, cutting a shaft of noise through once rural Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia. The Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament make their home here. It's their mother house, built by their founders and a future saint of the Catholic Church. But a lot has changed since this holy woman walked these grounds. Thousands of commuters speed by the mother house on the hill, oblivious to the spiritual history of the asphalt they roll over. On these acres at the turn of the century, Blessed Catherine Drexel began an apostolate devoted to the oppressed African Americans and American Indians of her day. Civil rights had early beginnings with this woman from Philadelphia. Catherine Drexel was the Superior General of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament from 1891 until 1937. And during that time, most of that time, from 1892 on, she was using this office to head the congregation. Catherine Drexel wrote to priests and bishops all over the country and indeed all over the world from this office, sometimes offering them her sisters to work in their diocese most of the time responding to their requests for sisters or for money. And she helped build schools, churches for the black and Indian peoples all over this country, and indeed outside this country, as far, as far away as Africa. Catherine Drexel may very well have kept financial matters and ongoing correspondence with various parts of the nation in the Shannon uh, cabinet. She was a prolific writer. In our archives, we have over 3,000 letters that she wrote during her lifetime. So this cabinet probably has seen all kinds of American history. While Blessed Catherine Drexel worked for civil rights inside, the rolling hills surrounding the mother house became the breadbasket for the sisters and students. The sisters were never directly engaged in the farming. Sometime at harvest time, we'd help out uh, here in the orchard or perhaps with chickens and things like that. When I was in the novitiate in the 50s, we would come down to see the newborn calves. 
But when Mother Catherine was here, it was still mainly the administrative uh, headquarters of the congregation and the training uh, site for the novices. And also the elderly sisters frequently would come here. Those days of peace for prayer and education are now gone. The urban sprawl of nearby Philadelphia has crept onto these suburban acres. Monolithic shopping malls now feed the needs for jewelry and clothes rather than contemplation because of easy access from an interstate cutting through the mother house yard. Of course, in the mid-1960s, I-95 came through our cornfield, and that was the end of a lot of things. Again, it was the end of the quiet and stillness that used to reign here. But then, of course, it was good training for us, too, because most of our places are in cities. We're in Harlem, we're in West Philadelphia, we're in uh, New Orleans, and large cities where there is a lot of noise. But the highway that carries shoppers to the sprawling malls also brings people on spiritual journeys to Blessed Catherine Drexel's mother house, the newest tourist attraction. Catherine Drexel died on March 3rd, 1955, when she was in her 97th year. She had led a very active life, one that was centered in prayer and in service to the uh, Afro-American and Native American peoples of this country. As you can see by these um, petitions, and a lot of people visit the crypt now from all over, and they come here because they recognize that Catherine Drexel is a special friend of God. They pray to her to ask the Lord to help them in their own lives, and they leave behind written requests. Visitors see the unique architectural touches Catherine Drexel wanted. Hardworking immigrant builders made Drexel's dream a reality. The, grant, the walls that you see behind me are made from granite. They were laid by immigrant workers who made approximately 90 cents an hour, which was pretty good pay in those days. On July 16, 1891, the cornerstone was laid here. It wasn't until years later that they discovered there had been actually a, a, a real danger that day, a real threat, because some of the farmers in the area were unhappy that Catholics were moving in here. And there was a rumor that the platform was going to be blown up. There was actually a stick of dynamite that was discovered. The ringing bells of the Mother House grounds chime for the ongoing crusade of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament to teach and uplift black and Native Americans across the United States, from Philadelphia to Louisiana to New Mexico. The legacy of Blessed Catherine Drexel began on these rolling acres, and the sisters continue her work today. Not even the roar of traffic will silence these bells. They signal a call for Christian charity, a call each of us must answer, but one that the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament answer every day, even over the distractions of the modern world. So now, when you travel Interstate 95 and you look over and see those large buildings with the red roofs, you'll know that that's the mother house for the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. And you know to stop there and pray the Blessed Catherine Drexel. Stop now and wait for us. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Minor. On July 26, 1990, we depart from Philadelphia for the beauty and culture of Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. The highlight of this deluxe 14-day tour is the performance of the Passion Play in Oberammergau. This magnificent event has been staged by the townspeople of the tiny Alpine village, and all persons traveling with Real to Real will receive a videotape and many other bonuses. Call 215-587-3775 and tell them you want to go to Oberammergau with Real to Real. Of every dollar donated to the House of Charity, 92 cents relieves hardship throughout South Jersey. Regardless of race, religion, or national origin, agencies financially assisted by the House of Charity help feed the hungry, clothe the poor, assist the elderly, heal the sick, train the disabled, and provide many other services. Please consider a generous tax-deductible contribution to the House of Charity's annual appeal, because every penny counts. Catholic Charities appeal is upon us again. Here's our envelope. We're asked to give. But why? 
What do they do with our money each year? Our guest today is here to explain just that. He's Dave Reed, Acting Director in the Office of Development for the Catholic Charities Appeal. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Now, this year's appeal begins on May 6th through the 20th, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And uh, everyone is asked to contribute, but when we give you the money, what becomes of it? The Catholic Charities Appeal funds many of the Archdiocesan Human Service programs. Included with this would be the Catholic Social Services, which is the largest voluntary nonprofit uh, network of ser services within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, aside from that, we also fund five day schools for special education, which serve over 400 children with specialized needs. We fund the Nutritional Development Services, which provide emergency food for the, uh, throughout the five-county area. We also fund things such as the Community Service Corps and the Retirement for Priests of the Archdiocese, where they need nursing home care. That's the Villa. Villa St. John and Villa St. Joseph. Yes, okay. And, the, and there are so many other components of this. Uh, two that come to mind are um, St. John's Hospice. St. John's Hospice is under the uh, care of Catholic Social Services, as is Mercy Hospice and Women of Hope. These are the facilities within the city of Philadelphia that take care frontline of the needs of the homeless people, mm -hmm. providing uh, shelters for them to stay and also providing meals for them. Now we have senior adult services also. The senior adult services are provided under the aegis of Catholic Social Services and this is for senior adults living in the community where they have a place to come um, to for recreational outlets and they can also uh, experience some friendship within their own age groups. So we take care of everyone from every spectrum of life, the old, the young, everyone in between. From the young to the old, there is a uh, adoption program for, the, for those that are young and we follow through providing uh, the facilities for nursing home care for those that are in their final years. Mm -hmm. I know someone who's in one of the nursing homes under the uh, Catholic Charities uh, and uh, they, they find the, the service excellent. Now Dave, what would happen where there are no Catholic Charities appeal? Is the, are, are these funds the primary funds for these agencies we're talking about? The Catholic Charities appeal provides the seed money, monies that are needed to generate funds from third parties, from government sources. If there, were no, if there were no Catholic Charities Appeal, the seed monies would not be there. The additional funding that we would be available to us would dry up and basically the services would have to be provided either through uh, some form of government and we all know that it's, uh, the church has been very, very active in providing these funds quality, quality care mm -hmm. for um, all segments of the community. Another service that comes to mind is the immigrants, the resettlement programs. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done with uh, um, refugees, isn't there? Catholic Social Services is very, very active in providing uh, services to the refugee, refugees, to immigrants that come in. There is a tremendous follow-up effort to make sure that all the uh, people that are coming to our area meet the qualifications for the uh, immigration and uh, naturalization pro pro programs that are available. Mm -hmm. What does the diocese ask of the contributor? What do they suggest we, we give? The Catholic Charities Appeal uh, leaves the decision of the individual contribution up to the contributor. As a guideline though, we do suggest that you consider one half of one percent of your annual income to go to the Catholic Charities Appeal. All right, and if you are not prepared to give when the appeal opens on May the 6th, you have until the 20th. Yes, and there is also a pledge program whereby the contributor can, when the solicitor calls on him, make arrangements to uh, make additional payments or payments in August and October and in December for mm -hmm. the Catholic Charities Appeal. Reminders will be sent from the appeal office. We have another minute or so to, to tell our viewers of some of other uh, ministries that are funded. One that comes to mind is the other week we interviewed someone from the criminal justice system, criminal justice department and the prison ministries. That I believe is funded also. The Catholic Charities Appeal also uh, provides funding to Catholic Social Services and under Catholic Social Services there is a uh, criminal uh, justice program whereby they would supply 
uh, people to the individual prisons mm -hmm. to again minister to their There's needs. so many, we can't get them into the Family, like family Life Bureau, Casa del Carmen, and I think that's all the time we have. We would hope, we would ask you to please reach deeply into your pocket and think about all the people you can help through the Catholic Charities Appeal. And Dave, I want to thank you for coming in and telling us about some of the services. Thank you very much. Now, I want to remind you that in the Diocese of Camden, you may contribute through the House of Charity, and their appeal begins May 6th. And in the Diocese of Trenton, we are asked to contribute through our individual parish appeals. Next up is Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons with our Re Strengths in Relationships segment. Why we are the way we are. Why are we weak or strong or aggressive or passive? Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons tells us in relationships. Most of us have a desire for a feeling of strength in our relationships. As children and teenagers, this feeling comes primarily from ex experience of being held by our parents. For most of us, this occurs more with our mothers than with our fathers. Now, there are some people who would enter their adult life without feeling this flow of love from parents into them to strengthen them. Many are not aware of this, and in their adult life, engage in behaviors to try to gain this feeling of strength, even though they may not even be aware that that's what they're really doing. Some of these behaviors include being overly controlling, being critical, always putting other people down to try to build themselves up, being excessively competitive, being a sports fanatic, overly involved with sports, through sexual acting out, heterosexually or homosexually, through compulsive eating to try to fill an emptiness, or taking in alcohol or drugs. I've treated so many men who said to me, my confidence, my strength is in this bottle. Okay, what can be done to resolve some of this pain so people can have a feeling of strength without engaging in these negative behaviors? First, to recognize that you need to feel strong, that you want to feel strong in your life. And the major way you can get this is by having a stable, loving relationship or a number of stable, loving relationships in your life. And it's important to work on these relationships. If you're engaged in some of this compulsive behavior to feel strong, then you've got to try to let go of that and engage in programs such as AA or NA or Courage, a self-help group for homosexuals. Also, it's important to think, I, ha I am loved. I've always been loved. One can use Christian meditation techniques here that can help resolve that feeling of emptiness within. I've seen many homosexuals who've done this for their childhood and adolescence, and then as adults could let go of their homosexual conflicts. But loving relationships take work, trust, and patience. The major feeling of strength in all of our lives comes from stable, loving relationships. If we have them and experience them on a daily basis, we're going to feel strong and free. Truly, our relationships in our formative years have everything to do with the way we turn out as adults. So be strong and stay with us now. We'll be right back. When we celebrate a service, we have Catholic, we have Protestant, we have different denominations of race sitting down together, and it don't matter if you're Catholic or if you're Protestant. What matters is that we're together and we're worshiping the Lord. made my day. Go ahead, make someone's day with love. We welcome your comments and suggestions and encourage you to write us at Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, room 907, Philadelphia, 19103. Or call us during regular business hours at 215-668-9842.
Each week on Real to Real, we learn about a variety of lifestyles and different sorts of ministries, don't we, Monsignor? We really can get into the ministries. I thought, Pat, once the best interview I had was a, a priest who worked with circus people. Mm -hmm. But we have a new one for you today, another kind of ministry and funny place to find values. Let's go to the track. You may not, you may not think that's a good place to find values, but when the real search for true values will be found really in the people that we serve. As long as man and horse have been partners in civilization, the horse race has been a part of our culture. A few moments where the blend of power, speed, and grace challenges the imagination, it quickens the heartbeat of even the most casual observer. In a scene repeated hundreds of times each day across America, a winner is rewarded and the public moves on to the next race. For all the millions of fans who've cheered a horse and jockey, very few people have ever cheered for those who labor behind the scenes, in the pre-dawn and early morning hours when much of the real work is done, when the area known as the backstretch or backside comes alive with its daily routines. It is here in the shadows of the barns where these modern-day gypsies work. Moving from one track season to the next, they are the exercise riders like Koran Wardlaw, who race only against the morning wind as they condition the horses. They are the grooms like Charles Clay, who feed and take care of the horses. They are the hot walkers like Greg Shoemaker, who cool down these delicate athletes by leading them in endless tours over familiar ground. For many people in the sport of racing, the hard work in the morning pays off in the afternoon, and at night they go home. But for many grooms and hot walkers, the track, the backstretch, is home. They live in small, single-room apartments, often only a whisper away from the animals they care for. The backstretch is in every way a small town unto itself, a place where men and women meet and marry a microcosm of the world that includes a restaurant and recreation facilities. It is sad but true that the track is often perceived as a place for misfits, a haven for eventual losers in the greater scheme of things. But the people who are part of this close-knit community know better, and organizations like the Horsemen's Protective Benevolent Association provide many essential services. We take care of all the employees on the backside their, and their families. Uh, we have a medical clinic here on the track. With, we have four doctors. We have a nurse. We have a dentist. We have an eye doctor. And uh, we take care of all the backside employees. And going hand in hand with physical well-being, many tracks have realized their employees need spiritual sustenance as well. For the residents of the backstretch at Santa Anita, that guidance is personified in chaplain Theodore Carreras, a man whose chapel is found anywhere he walks and whose mission is encouraging the presence of a God who is worshipped in many ways by a congregation that shares no common language, background, or religion. There's a big community here. I mean, we're talking about 2,500 or, or maybe more that are living here, that have made that track their home. According to society, there, there was no hope for them outside, but there's been hope here. And I guess we understand that, uh, that they're going through these trials and tribulations and problems, so we try to put the pieces together, and, and it works. Uh, it's not a 100% uh, guaranteed thing, but most of the time it does work. Chaplain Ted, as he is known on the backstretch, doesn't have a big church or even a small pulpit. Instead, tucked away on the end of one of the barns is a simple office that serves as the hub of religious life on the backside. When we celebrate a service, we have Catholic, we have Protestant, we have different denominations of rice sitting down together, and it don't matter if you're Catholic or if you're Protestant. What matters is that we're together and we're worshiping the Lord and we're praising God. 
For exercise rider Karan, who's recovering from drug abuse with the help of a program administered at the track, Chaplain Ted is a voice of reason and compassion in a world where gambling, alcohol, and drugs are readily available. Chaplain Ted has basically taught me how to live. He's a real understanding guy. You know, he won't scorn you. If anything, he'll just try to, what he does is he'll push you and try to motivate you into doing the right thing. Doing the right thing in a world of temptation can be a tricky problem. I have been called by uh, a groom uh, or a high walk and say, a chaplain, you know, I'm down in my money. The only $2 that I have left, I want to put him to win on this horse. Could you please pray for me so he could win? I usually say this, uh, I pray so the horse could be healthy, but I don't know about winning. More often, the winning ticket is Chaplain Ted's encouragement for the dreams of people like Greg Shoemaker, who wants to one day become a cartoonist. I feel very comfortable and uh, very happy to know that there's a man of God on the backside willing to uh, help and to support myself and um, others in any need. Perhaps the greatest need for Greg, for his wife Kathy, a groom, and for all the workers on the backstretch is separating the emphasis placed on winning or losing in their sport from their lives. Being dependent on the uncertain successes of the animals they care for can overwhelm the sense of personal value everyone strives for. They worth more than the animals that they are taking care of. I know these animals sometimes cost a lot of millions of dollars, and, and I appreciate that, and I love this animal because I, I love horses also myself. But nothing is more valuable but than a human life. And we let them know that they, they have that value, that uh, they worth a lot, and God loves them. And so it is that for Chaplain Ted and his people on the backstretch, the real champion in the sport of kings is the king of kings. That's a great ministry, Pat, but the whole idea is a sure gamble when you go on horses. But what is a sure bet, do you think? A sure bet would be to put your money on the Catholic Charities Appeal. You can be sure that the investment will be a big payoff for someone. It's been marvelous to watch the appeal grow down through the years, Pat, and see the surety that that has provided for so many people so who many. suffered. Mm -hmm. And the services provided by the Catholic Social Service are just really astronomical. They really are so, comprehensive. They run the gamut of human life, yes. And running the gamut of human life, well, something else I want to share with you. You know, you were so responsive to Father Tom Leger Station at Cross a few weeks ago. We prepared for Easter. We want you to know we still have opportunities for you to share in Father Tom's great stations at the cross. So if you have forgotten to write and you wanted to, why don't you write to us and we'll send you one of these great copies of Father Tom Leger Stations at the Cross. Did you write for yours, Pat? No, I'm going to get a free one. <laughs> uh, they're oh, all free. Bonus. <laughs> so, now don't forget, this year when you're budgeting, write a check to Catholic Charities, won't you? Goodbye now and God bless you. Goodbye for now. Travel arrangements for Real to Real by Atkinson and Mullen, Newtown Square, PA, 215-359-5980.